Good day, colleagues, and I want to thank the Farmer to Farmer USAID, Partners of America and RADA for hosting this lovely small room and session here on Zoom. And we believe for a sector that has been known to lack the adaptation of technology, it's great to see us now, you know, doing online trainings to support our farmers out there in the field. I am your presenter, Mr. Khalil Brown, as you know, the high pros animal nutritionist. I am an animal scientist that focuses on ruminant nutrition. I've done my studies in Israel, here in Jamaica, and I've participated in a lot of the projects there in committees or project developments for a lot of the small ruminant projects that has taken part in Jamaica for the past seven years. Today, my presentation will focus on small ruminant nutrition in Jamaica. You know, we'll focus on our feeding systems, our forages, infrastructure needed to improve this sector, um, guided by research that has been done over time. First, let's look at the situation analysis. As Jamaica, you know that we have a very high import bills of both sheep and goat meat into our country, close to billions of dollars, Jamaican dollars, and we barely produce any meat or milk in Jamaica. We are traditionally a goat meat type of culture, so the government and the regulatory agencies and even the private sector have put in support system in place to try to grow this industry. Even with these efforts, we still have a lot of constraints that face the small ruminant sector. One is that the sector is still working outside the government regulatory framework in some cases. Um, access to genetics, breeding females, a comprehensive nutrition program, basic animal husbandry to improve on-farm practices. We have biosecurity concerns, and the biggest issue of all is predial larceny. This coupled with an underdeveloped small ruminant value chain doesn't allow for niche marketing of products like milk and cheese, and so very accessible. However, it is being done. Before any recommendation can be made, it's important that we have a better understanding of the sector. So we conducted a survey done online to capture some of our farmers' feedback. Let's review some of them. One of the first questions asked was, you know, how long have you been in goat rearing? And we have seen that we have a lot of new entrants. Over 52% of the participants were under one to five years in the industry. A very important question for our survey is the amount of acreage of land that is dedicated to your production. And as you can see, over 50% of the farmers had less than one acre of land dedicated to their small ruminant production. And also, majority of them use both a pasture and cut and carry system. Farmers with limited land space have to depend on going outside of their farms to harvest their forages or to purchase hay or silage to support their system. This can be very costly and very labor intensive. However, this is a good indication that farmers are aiming to achieve what we call a balanced diet. And as Dr. Rodriguez said, a balanced diet is important while using the important nutrients like your proteins, your carbohydrates, your fats and your minerals. A key takeaway point that all farmers should take from this presentation is to understand the normal growth curve. That some farmers will achieve a, a higher weight of gain and that's because they understand the nutrient requirement for the animal. Another important point that should be taken is to understand that also the nutrient requirement also depends on the breed. In Jamaica, we have native, boar and dairy breeds and we should carefully consider how is it that we feed each type of these animals. Here in Jamaica, we experience an energy deficiency and from our survey, it's clear that the farmers actually purchase a lot of high energy diets. If you look at it, they have a lot of molasses being consumed, a lot of corn mash and, and sweet middling which are all high energy ingredients. Dr. Rodriguez also talked about the importance of understanding the nutrient value of each ingredient. That's why it's important to work with a firm that gives you these proximate analysis and also based your formulation on this type of information. It's here at HyPro, we actually use Dairyland Laboratories to conduct our nutrient analysis that we use to assist in our TMR formulations and unformed formulations. We now can look into the big debate, the debate between what is the feed delivery system of choice for the Jamaican livestock sector. Is it grazing or is that we're going to start to intensify our production system and head more into the total mixed ration system that we've been proven to show better productivity. No doubt the partial system has proven and has benefits of being a lower production system and also provides the best animal comfort. However, the disadvantage of seeing lower productivity due to less control over the diet is an issue that we need to weigh. Dr. Jennings has already outlined in the dairy sector 
that our tropical forages could not allow us to be above that sustainable benchmark for a dairy sector and would require concentrate inputs up to 50%. Lalo himself, our Jamaican researcher in Trinidad, focused on heat stress and has shown us that the level of impact on our animals is extensive throughout the entire year, even during the colder periods. This is a clear indication for us to adopt a more intensive system focusing on providing nutrient-dense diets. And this can only be achieved by developing a sustainable feedstock system, which means we have to invest in the right infrastructure. Feeding system infrastructure begins within the house. How is it that we present and give access or raw ingredients to animals? So you're looking at your feeding troughs, your feeding spacing, and the different type of feeders that you want to have. One for your forages, one for your grains, one for your minerals, etc. Then we further look into the best mechanism for us to harvest this raw ingredients or to utilize it. We start looking at our shafting machine, which I recommend most farmers should have on their farm. I would then look to get in a, a forage harvester if I have a larger scale farm and definitely a TMR wagon to assist me with mixing my diets. These are to me the top two machines going forward. Hypers introduced the total mixed ration wagon for the dairy sector and we're currently bringing in the TMR wagons for small ruminants that we believe will change the landscape of the industry. After designing your feed delivery system and looking into animal husbandry practices like your feeding time and the breeding frequency, um, additional husbandry practices like for a pregnancy check that might allow you know, to adjust the animal diet you have laid the foundation for your feed plan. However, the most successful farmer is the one who masters this next topic, and that's the effective utilization of pastures, which is definitely the main ingredient that we need to drive our ruminant sector. Farmers must learn to master how that you can optimize the nutritive value of grazed pastures and also improve and promote the intake of grazed or conserved herbage. That's the key feature needed to unlock the small ruminant industry. This kind of activity can be found in this research that we conducted at Bodo's where we looked at over 15 different local forages and determined when was the best time to harvest. Looking at the crude protein, looking at the fiber content, and that was an important criteria for us determining and selecting when was it best for us to harvest this crop. Recently, I conducted a very similar sample using the Mombasa grass in St. Elizabeth and in St. Catherine, looking at these various parameters over week six and week 12 to determine, you know, when was that best time to ensure that we're getting there and harvest that Mombasa. From my experience, we can see that our grasses, you know, average between five to 12%, our legumes from 15 up to as high as 24. And we have a lot of grasses we can select from, and it's really down to accessibility seed accessibility, planting material accessibility, the soil is very important and we really have to take into consideration the agronomic processes to manage these crops going forward. Um, we have leguminous trees that has been supporting us like the Lucina, um, Centra semen that has been found in our pastures. We have the non-leguminous shrubs, the mulberry and the trichanthera, excellent crops going forward. We can even have them in combination together as one and like Cabra Ranch have a lovely grass legume combination pasture that they really use for their maintenance models that support them well. So if we master how best to harvest, when best to harvest, now we can master when best to conserve. In time of excess, of course, we can also master it down to the science where we harvest this crop at the best time of its nutritive value to conserve for a later date. And we have various options in Jamaica that we use. We use hay, which is accessible commercially, or farmers can simply dry their own grasses or leguminous shrubs that they have and support their system like that. In Jamaica, we also practice what we call a live fodder bank, like your, for example, a sugarcane field. It's a good source of energy for your animals or your king grass. And we also practice silage. However, these pictures are in Israel and on one day we're going to get there. But our silage system now was taken off to where we're actually looking at those 50 ton silage bags. We're doing this project out, out in the east. Um, we actually do the little bag silages up at Cabra Ranch doing our small training. And what is taking place is that we have linked ourselves with the Jamaica Dairy Development Board to push this program as we want farmers to conserve during the time of excess to have it during the drought period. Um, this is us and Miss Peter Gay Watson from RADA um, doing garbage bag silage bags out in St. Thomas. 
Dr. Rodriguez spoke about our tropical parties being very low in water soluble carbohydrates and the need for us to add, you know, additives, silage additives to our systems. In Jamaica, we have access to molasses, we have access to urea, and some farmers even use salt, which is a no no. Here, we conducted a research using little bag silage and using different local additives urea, molasses, salt, and the control. And we saw that molasses had the lower pH. Um, also, we saw that a rapid decline in pH. And in the little bag silage, we saw even distribution in the pH across the bags when we use molasses. An important feature that we also wanted to train our farmers in was the actual silage quality check. So you need to check your pH, check your nutrient value and the stability and look, look for moles. We went further in our research work to even look at a mix of king grass and sugar cane and a mix with king grass, sugar cane with a legume, you know, with using molasses and lactobacillus as the additives and looking at the fermentative characteristics and the chemical composition of, of that mix. You can look and see that a combination of king grass and sugar cane will just give you around 6% protein. But once we added about 20% of that diet with moringa and cannavale, we bumped that crude protein level up to 11%. Um, so that combination was kind of showing you how that we can mix local forages also to improve that diet quality that we expect. But let's look at the research for a little bit. From the research, we saw that both the lactobacillus and the molasses, you know, could assist us. I um, mean, dropping that pH rapidly, you know, keep it at a lower level that we know would maintain, you know, proper silage quality, it would kill those bad bacteria that we don't want. We saw, even though we made a mix, we saw, you know, minimal reduction in, in protein, which is a good thing. We want a stable silage. So with molasses becoming scarce, we had to use a lactobacillus, meaning we're looking at effective microorganisms as an option. And I was lucky enough to do research like this here in Jamaica and, in, and both in Israel when I did my studies. And we looked at a product called EM Zoo and it in combination with urea and looked at the effects on what the fermentation characteristics and the aerobic stability. Let's just give a small review of this. From the experiment, we saw an increase in lactic acid production when using EM Zoo or with EM Zoo and urea. We also saw less carbon dioxide production when using the inoculant with urea which signaled that it was more aerobic stable we even did a microbial count test for moles and using the inoculant even the inoculant with urea we had less production of moles being found on our plant count a clear indication of the benefits of using effective microorganisms in our silage and might be the ingredient we need for silage making in, in jamaica going forward since molasses is a big issue I mentioned this topic earlier, however, I didn't stress on a solution. The problem is heat stress, which is probably one of the biggest issues that we face going forward. Um, it depresses dry matter intake, reduces weight gain and milk yield, and we need a solution for it. And it sometimes requires some heavy investments into infrastructure or just simply planting a tree. And that's why we promote the adoption of the civil pastoral system as it will motivate farmers to look into utilizing local resources as a part of their feeding solution. And this is where further local research is needed to help us guide to build this local forage and byproduct and ingredient database that will allow farmers to select and to better understand which ingredient is a high protein, which ingredient is a high energy, and we can use it during different physical stages of our small ruminants. To complete our feeding plan, we have to look into some of the issues that we might face in the field. And I've personally seen grain overloading as an issue, um, bloating that may occur from having too much starchy diets or too much high sugar diets. So we always have to have farmers keeping their baking soda or their mineral oil on farm in case we need to solve these problems by you know, giving the animal our rumen buffer. Small rumen supplementation is also a very important feature and you know, a very important one for me. As I do work with one of the major or the biggest supply in the Caribbean, Hypro. So let us look at probably our feeding program for small ruminants where we have a general maintenance ration, a goat ration, a dairy ration, a TMR protein, and we also give you free choice minerals to fully supplement your animal as a complete diet. In closing, the stage is set for the small ruminant industry to achieve um, optimal nutritional programs you know we have to understand the appropriate use of our local feed resources and see how well we can balance it with our concentrate and mineral supplementation you know, as a holistic approach to our animal nutrition however 
we need to first change the culture. We have to look at a more data-driven culture. You know, we need to understand the dynamics of pasture yields and digestibility and look more into our animal feed intakes. We have to also measure the impact of heat stress on animal intake and the effects on its physiological conditions. We have to expand the further conservation as we move forward as a sector and, you know, look at the impact of the dry season on our productivity to evaluate. So we can see that further conservation is a very important technique going forward for us. So I want to thank you guys for listening and I do hope to get a phone call from you guys so we can you know, move forward together and see how well we can drive this sector going forward. Thank you.